Well, good morning. It's good to see you back in the big tent this morning. Welcome to day two of Brainstorm Tech. We hope this morning's breakfast sessions were insightful. So we have a terrific lineup of speakers ready to take on the issues of the day. This morning we're going to hear from another tech boom city, from a presidential hopeful. Uh, what WeWork's Adam Newman is up to next, the future of Meta's metaverse business, how fintech can create good in the world, plus much, much more. And as always, we encourage you to get involved, ask questions, share insights, tweet, the whole nine yards. But before we start, we would like to acknowledge our event partners for their continued support and contribution to this event. They are Salesforce and China Guizhou Mutai Group, our premier partners, our partners IDA Ireland, Mitsuo Americas, New York Stock Exchange, Qualtrics, our sponsor KPMG, and host of Fortune Founders Forum Threshold Ventures. So a quick reminder uh, for our reporting and social media rules, what's said on stage or in the breakout sessions is on the record, including Q&A. But what's said over uh, a table during a meal or on a break is private unless the two parties agreed uh, otherwise. So why don't we get started? So yesterday after hearing about how Utah is emerging as a mini tech hub, let's shift our focus 2,500 miles to the southeast to another rising tech hotspot, Miami. Over the last two years, Miami has seen an astounding 89% surge in the number of startups uh, coming from there with incredible uh, revenue growth for those companies. And there's been a lot of buzz about Miami potentially emerging as a major tech hub to eventually, maybe, just maybe, compete with the likes of Austin and even challenge Silicon Valley. Miami is tout touted by its proponents not only for its mild weather and cosmopolitan culture, but also its pro-business environment. So joining us next is Keith Robois, general partner at Founders Fund, a prominent investor and entrepreneur, and a very big cheerleader for the city of Miami. And we also have the mayor of the city of Miami, Francis Suarez, who is also a Republican presidential candidate for the 2024 election, which is drawing a large field, as you all know. So please, welcome to the stage, and they'll be interviewed by Brainstorm Tech co-chair, Terry Burns. Okay, Keith, Mayor Suarez, thank yeah. you guys for being here today. Pleasure. So I want to be totally honest with both of you. When we were doing some of the networking dinners and, and whatnot yesterday, a few folks were asking, is the Silicon Valley slash tech rush to Miami still a thing? Is it still happening? Obviously, this was a really hot topic at the peak of COVID. Uh, lots of folks like to go to Florida for tax reasons. But anecdotally, it feels like maybe a little bit of the uh, rush around it has died down a little bit. So maybe we'll start with you, Keith. Is it still a thing? And if so, is it sustainable? Miami as a tech ecosystem is accelerating every day. Um, I'll give you some quantitative evidence as well, some anecdotal evidence. The anecdotal evidence is there's now thousands of successful tech people that live in Miami. Um, there's so many that in fact, when people move, I actually don't even know about it. When I first met the mayor, it was a Sunday night after I moved to Miami, there was exactly 13 people at this dinner that had ever done anything in tech that was interesting. There's now like over 1,300. And when and, was this? Uh, Sunday. Like which year? Uh, 2020, December Ish. 12th. Cool. Yep. Um, so like literally one, two orders of magnitude in two, two and a half years. Like literally like there's famous people that moved to Miami that have been very successful in tech that you would recognize all their names that they show up and I might get a text that says, I just signed a lease or I just bought a house. And I had literally nothing to do with moving them. The first 50, I had a lot to do with moving them by hand. And it just continues to propel. So we took our fund. We looked at our data at Founders Fund. We have we just finished Founders Fund 7. We triggered Founders Fund 8 recently. And in Founders Fund 7, we went from $0 invested in Miami in the prior fund to over 11%. Hmm. And I only moved to Miami halfway through the fund. My partners, Delian and Matias, and our new hire, Sam Blonde, and Peter only moved to Miami more than halfway through the fund. So 10 or 11% of the fund, you could almost double that as a fraction of what we're investing in Miami. Mayor Suarez? Uh, look, I, it's a, he's one of my best evangelists. <laughs> <laughs> We've moved uh, in AUM about three trillion approximately in the last 24 months, and we've grown our venture capital pipeline by about 500%. That's based on the fundamentals, right? What are the fundamentals that we've um, focused on? One is we care about our customer. If you look at 
um, some of the examples across America where you know, a city competes for the Amazon HQ2 prize, they win it, and then they say, no, thank you, right? Or they kick out you know, Elon Musk, who's arguably one of the wealthiest people uh, and most innovative people on the planet from their ecosystem. We did the fundamentally opposite thing, which is what we welcome people uh, to Miami with my uh, sort of infamous tweet that Delian started, uh, a member of the Founders Fund, saying, hey, what if we move Silicon Valley to Miami? And I responded, how can I help? So there was an attitudinal difference. That hasn't changed. I don't think that that, that macro has changed. I don't think that now some of these cities have gotten in and said, oh, no, we want to be more welcoming. I, I haven't seen that. I still haven't seen those cities taking care of their customers. So I think that's number one. The SALT deduction is still in play, right, in terms of the fact that it's not usable. It, it's supposed to phase out in the future, but it's, it's still there. So that macro hasn't changed. Uh, and so, and, and I think in terms of things like uh, direct connections, right? We're looking now at direct connections with uh, Saudi Arabia. We have direct connections uh, with basically every single Middle Eastern country. Um, we brought the FII, which is the, the fu uh, Future Investment Initiative, to Miami this year. Uh, we think Saudi's gonna open an, a, a Ministry of Investment office uh, and also potentially a PIF office uh, in Miami. So we're seeing closer connections there. Um, Jap we're working on Japan and we're working on uh, Korea. So we're, we're looking at getting connected to Asia. So as all that happens, it, it, it continues this process of, of creating what my vision is, which is the epicenter of capital or the capital of capital. It takes time. It's not an overnight thing. Uh, as, as, as Keith has said, it's been scaled at an incredibly fast pace. I mean, we went from, you know, I remember we were just doing a, over a billion dollars in VC deals. Now we're doing over $5 billion in VC deals, right? San Francisco still holds a dominant position, but I think uh, that can change. I do believe you should never take the perspective that you're too big to fail. Sure. And I think yeah. that's part of the problem. And then I'd say the one thing that we're all working on as an ecosystem is how do we co continue to create talent, right? We've been an intellectual talent importer uh, in this, we're number one in tech job growth uh, in, this, in, in this last couple of years. We want to create and, and cultivate our own talent and we're looking at a variety of different ways to do that. So as we talk more about cultivating the talent, the community, the ecosystem in Miami, South Florida, and Florida in general, I want to talk a little bit about politics. So you recently announced your presidential candidacy run for the Republican Party. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Silicon that's one, Valley. That's the, that's the 1% right there. <laughs> There's a lot of one percenters in here for sure. Uh, Silicon Valley, of course, has historically leaned more progressive yeah. than South Florida and Florida in general. What impact do you think that the sort of tech influx will have on local politics? And how do you personally feel about that? Do you mean in presidential politics? Um, presidential and yeah, local politics as well. I, I think as, as a public official, you're an ecosystem builder, right? You have two roles. You have to run the corporation and then you have to build ecosystems because building ecosystems is what creates prosperity for the people that you serve. Uh, as a president and as a, as a mayor, it's really no different. You're, you're trying to create an ecosystem based on generational opportunities. And what I see, and sort of my vision, is this country ne needs to win the generational tsunami of opportunities that are coming before it. Uh, that takes volition, that takes action, that takes uh, positioning. And our competitors are positioning themselves. And if we think that that's not happening, we should not bury our head in the sand, right? Like, again, this concept that America is the greatest country on, on, you know, on the planet, I believe that. But I also believe in the concept that you're not too big to fail. So you can never take your, let's call it supremacy or your, or your, your positioning for granted. You always gotta be competing every single day uh, to make sure that you're taking advantage of the opportunities of the future. We know what they are, everybody knows what they are, whether it's green tech, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's crypto, whether it's um, uh, quantum computing, the space race, um, virtual reality, et cetera. I mean, we all know what those industries are, um, but we have to continue to position ourselves as a country. And whoever gets elected president in 2024, whether it's me or someone else, I really hope that you all, who are our bosses, choose someone that can position our country for your children. That's my call to action to you. Find that person. I hope it's me. But if it's not me, find that person because that's really what we should be looking for in 2024. Um, and my last little call to action would be that if anything that I say compels you, donate a dollar to my campaign. I have a website, www.francisuarez.com. Um, obviously, I'd love for you to donate more, 
but we have to reach a threshold of 40,000 contributors in 220 states to get on the debate stage. If I don't have the volume to tell my story, to share my vision, then it's hard for me to break through the different, what I call price support levels, uh, to become a, a more credible candidate. Keith, will you be supporting the mayor's candidacy? Well, I have the benefit of being a conservative Republican, and there's a, several like really great people running for president, so we'll see how things evolve. Obviously, his vision for Miami has been incredibly compelling. It's been incredibly compelling to a lot of progressives who moved from the Bay Area and are thrilled. Like Most of my friends who moved from the Bay Area were not conservatives, and now they're extremely uh, addicted, fanatic you know, supporters of the mayor. Um, these are all people that used to vote Democrat that almost surely voted for Hillary and Biden, and now they're becoming Republican because of the policies we have in Miami and in Florida generally. Is that a yes? Yes. Well, I mean, supporting him, I also have a lot of fan. You know, I'm a longtime fan of several other candidates running. Okay. I want to open up questions to the audience here. So if anyone has a question, we have some of the mic runners going around. Oh, we have one right over there. Uh, good morning, Phil Wabo with Fortune. So Miami has a lot going for it, but it's also in the state of Florida, so you're not <laughs> removed. Really? Yeah. So my, my question is, you know, the governor of Florida yeah. has expressed some views, uh, some of his ads, some of the policies, yeah. for example, uh, with regard to the LGBTQ community. Yeah. So the question first for Keith is, do you ever fear that that could be seen as a disincentive for some companies and towns and people to want to move to Florida? And for you, Mayor uh, Suarez, is, is there an opening for you to differentiate yourself from the governor who is also running for president? I would say very clearly, my husband and I are significant supporters of the governor and all of his policies. Um, we think like what he's doing for Florida is the recipe that should be copied in every state, period, without exception. My answer is yes and yes. Um, yes, it's impacting the state negatively, and yes, it is an opportunity for me to differentiate myself at some level. Um, uh, look, it, it, I've gotten the calls, right, from people who have decided not to come here. Obviously, the fight with Disney, um, a variety of different issues. I've talked about it publicly. We're, we're very different people. Miami is a different place than the rest of the state of Florida. We're extremely welcoming um, to all communities. Um, and I think uh, it is something that, 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 that I'm different with him on, and I'm proud to be different with him on. Look, I run a company of 130 people in, in Miami. 14, 15% of the company is like gay or lesbian, and they've all moved, chosen to move from San Francisco, LA, and New York. What, I'm, I'm curious to double down on this a little bit though. What do you really think the challenge is here? Because a lot of folks from various backgrounds who are more progressive leaning, won't go to Florida, won't go to Miami. Well, if they visit, they will stay because they're safe. So one of the easiest ways to get people to move to Miami is you tell them to come visit for a week. And then they walk outside and they're safe. They're not accosted by homeless people. They don't see drugs on the street. They don't, if there's crime, the police respond. So a very real example, um, my deputy at Open Store um, and his husband moved from San Francisco and they bought a house, which actually you can't afford to do in the Bay Area anyway, but they bought a house at 29 years old. And uh, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., there was someone in the backyard playing around with their air conditioning unit. They called the police. Five police cars in four minutes. The last time something like that happened to the Bay Area, I know because I was over their house in the Dolores Park, it took two hours to get one police car. So you cannot build a company, you cannot build a family if nobody is safe. If everybody's distracted all the time, literally I can name every single week someone in the Bay Area that I know that's a victim of crime. How in the world can you build a family or a company that way? Yeah. So if I can just jump in on that. So what, what Keith is describing is what I consider to be the most important quality in building a city other than the, the ecosystem, which is quality of life, right? We want to build a premium quality of life because for everyone in this room, you all share one, we all share something similar, which is time is our only finite commodity, right? So you want to invest your time in the, in the best way possible. So for us, our quality of life metrics are simple. Uh, I lowered taxes to the lowest level in history. We had double digit growth, 12% growth last year. Last year we had the lowest per capita homicide rate since 1964. I was born in 1977. This year we're 36% below that 1964 per capita low. If we finish the year 
on a per capita basis as we've gone through half the year, we would be the seventh on a per capita basis for cities of, of a population over 400,000, we'd be the seventh safest on a per capita basis in America. By the way, some of them are here in Utah and Indiana, like cities that are not very well known cities. I mean, think of Miami in that sense from the 80s, what it used to be. And then we talked a little bit about tech job growth, number one in the nation. We're number one in wage growth and we're number one, uh, we have the lowest unemployment in America and we have 608 homeless. And we, we put out a challenge to be the first major urban city to have zero homeless because we believe that what we do for the least of our brothers and sisters is what we do, is how we define ourselves in many ways. So I, I think Miami's a little different. You know, we, we are very welcoming. We're a city that, um, you know, believes in, in building. We don't believe in, 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 in destroying jobs. We, we believe in building jobs and creating jobs, right? Uh, and that's what we've done and we've done it very successfully. I think that the, the concept of quality of life, of safety, these core values are things that we, we can all get it's behind. It's a core value. I imagine that some of the folks in here, myself, to Phil's question, DeSantis, might have some differing opinions as to what safety and quality of life looks like, but uh, I appreciate that call out. There's another question out back here. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Hey, Mayor Suarez, uh, Keith, thank you for a very interesting conversation up there. Uh, I'm Ed Watal. I uh, will be teaching AI at the New York University fall yeah, yeah. Uh, at the New York University later this fall so I'm very interested in the impact of AI on an education and you mentioned that education is a key part of your agenda I'm very curious how do you see AI uh, impacting education and how does your vision intersect I'm also want to get the venture capital perspective and uh, my little anecdote here uh, you know, I would imagine that you know, there's 100 million users using OpenAI, and if everybody was paying 20 bucks, it's a very viable business model and very profitable. I got a subscription, I canceled it eventually because I didn't see value in it. Sorry if anyone's from OpenAI is in the room. No offense to anyone. My son continues to be a subscriber, except he's using a shared account with four other high schoolers, everyone pooling $5 each. So help them reduce your cost a little bit, but I'd like the perspective from the leaders on the, on the stage. I'll quickly add, um, as we were talking about education, there's some local critics that talk a lot about local research universities within South Florida and the role that they have in the sort of Silicon Valley rush into the region. So if you could sort of tie those together as well. So I'm a big proponent. In two minutes. Yeah, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a big proponent of school choice um, and radical disruption in the, in the education space. So um, we created a Miami Tech Charter School. So under, you know, underprivileged children in our community can go and get an associate's degree in a tech field for free in the city of Miami. We also created two scholarship funds that were um, private sector funded. One of them is for Pell Grant recipients first in their family to go to college, they go to college for free. The other one is Pell Grant recipients who want a STEM degree, they go to college at four participating universities for free. I raised all of that as private sector funding for Pell Grant recipient students, the neediest in my community. Um, I, I believe in virtual reality schooling, trying to school at scale. I believe in artificial intelligence as a force multiplier, you know, and helping people. It's no different than what we're doing, a lot of kids are doing now with Google and trying to, to and the beauty of education is you can educate yourself. That's the beauty of it is, is, is you know, and Elon talks about this all the time. You know, you can educate yourself. There's so much information that's available at your fingertips. And I, I've tried the Google AI. I find it to be very, very good. Um, it doesn't have the, the 2021 limitation. Um, and, and I found it to be excellent. You see some biases though in the AI, and that, that's something that does bother me a little bit. I wish sometimes the answers didn't have what appears to me to be a bias, um, but that'll, I'm sure, get, get worked out through competition. Final 30 seconds here, Keith. Yeah, on education, um, obviously the education system in the United States as a whole is broken. I mean, you can see it in the data. It's like the worst educational performance in X, Y, and Z time. Obviously, vis-a-vis -vis our existential threat with China, it's broken. We need to do things about it, but working with the system is probably not the right answer. So we tend to fund things that go around the system. I'd say the biggest educational experiment that has turned into massive success under the radar is homeschooling. Yeah. Um, since 1977, we went from something like 5,000 kids being homeschooled to 5 million with significantly better outcomes, period, on any basis you could ever measure and cut by any demographic. So we're looking for ways to amplify homeschooling, like making it easier, low friction, um, you know, more successful. Um, anything that AI can do to allow people to teach themselves is great. Um, from a venture capital perspective, 
I've worked at both funds that have invested in OpenAI. Um, the only KV is the only original venture investor. Uh, we funded a founders fund the most recent round. I don't know that there's venture returns in other companies, but OpenAI will do pretty well. There's so much that I wish we could have more time to talk about. We didn't even get to get into Miami coin, but we can get, talk about that another time. No Mayor time. Suarez, no time. Mayor Suarez, Keith, thank you so much. Thank you.